Are you alive? Well, let's get ready. Hey, let us stand while Deborah's going to the piano. How many knows that Jesus is alive? How many knows the importance of that? We're going to find out this morning how important it was that Jesus Christ be resurrected, especially in the uh, second part of the service. Boy, it looks like we've got a nice crowd about halfway from here on back, right? I'm waiting for some words. Here we go. request that we have taken, uh, let's remember those, uh, well, we have this part of the service, let's take those people in our mind and our heart and our spirit and let's be praying. Turn, um, turn in your Bibles to the gospel according to St. Luke chapter 24, verse 6. He is not here. Aren't you glad that they couldn't find Jesus Christ as far as his body dead, but he was alive? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee. I'm going to move my Bible because it weighs so much that it keeps moving my stand. There are two great facts about that of Christianity. And it makes, it makes Christianity different from all the religions of that of the world. Here's the first reason. Christianity is vitally bound up with a person. 
In other words, the main thing about Christianity is not about a thing, but it is about a person. And that person is the Lord Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son. He was born of that of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He performed many mighty miracles. He would die a vicarious death on that of a shameful cross. He was buried in a barred tomb. He rose from the dead and ascended up to heaven from where one day he will return and set up that of his everlasting kingdom. Yes, it's true. Christianity is centered around the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be a good Buddhist and know very little or nothing about Buddha. You can be a good Mohammedan and really know very little about that of Muhammad. And the reason being is because these religions are just religions of form and that of ritual. But you can't be a Christian without knowing Jesus Christ. You can't be a Christian with an accept that you're going to trust Him and you're going to love Him and you're going to follow Him. Christianity really is Christ. You see, we become Christians not by accepting really a creed or system of ethics, but we become a Christian by accepting a person, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Gospel according to John, chapter 1 and verse, uh, verse 12, but as many as received Him. Have you received Him? He has given us power. Power to do what? To become the sons of that of God. To become the children of that of God. To become sons and daughters of that of God. To become part of the family of that of God even to them that believe on his name. Jesus said in Revelation 3 and 20, he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come to him and sup with him and he with me. So the first fact is Christianity is vitally bound up in a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. Here's the second fact of Christianity. And here's what makes it different from every other religion of the world. And it's this. In this religion, its founder is not dead. But its founder is alive. Even although, and I'm around it all to 2,000 years ago, when Christianity began, its founder that started this movement, this belief, he still lives and is still alive. And no other religion can make that boast. You can go to the Mecca and to the Mohammedan and say, and they will say, here is the grave. Here is the grave of our founder that found our religion. Here's the grave of Mohammedan or Muhammad. But when you go to the grave where Jesus was buried in Jerusalem, here's what you hear the angels from heaven saying. 
Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. The cross is a symbol of the Christian religion. But can I tell you, it is an empty cross. It's not a crucifix. You see, because Jesus is alive. He's our leader. He's our founder. He's alive, and He's alive not just for today, but tomorrow. And He's alive, and He's alive forever. And He is at the very center of that, of our religion. He's a living Lord. He's a Savior who, what, loves us and saves us and keeps us. But He walks with us, and He talks with us, and He tells us, Hey, you're my own. A living Christ. Let me tell you a little about this living Christ and we'll pray. He is the son of that of the living God. In the gospel according to Matthew, it's in chapter 16 and the emphasis is on verse 16. But Jesus is passing through the coast of Caesarea Philippi. And he asked his disciples the point blank question. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And the response was, some say that they're Jeremiah. Some say that you're the one of the Old Testament prophets. Some say that you're John the Baptist. And then point blank Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? You know, it's important about how people feel and what they think about Christ and what their opinion is. But the most important thing is, is that's secondary, but what the most important thing is, who do you say that he is? Who do you say that he is personally? Well, you know what Simon Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of that of the living God. Do you remember Jesus' response to that of Martha? and the raising of death of Lazarus in John 11, 25, and 26. Jesus has delayed his coming about the sickness of death of Lazarus. And he tarries long where he's at. And basically he point blank tells his disciples, hey, Lazarus is dead. And as Jesus is making his way towards death of Bethany, you remember that he's going to be approached by that of Martha. And Jesus Christ's crucifixion has not taken place yet. His death and his resurrection has not taken place yet. But you know what Jesus tells that of, that of Martha? Hasn't taken place yet, but he says, but you know what? He says, but I am the resurrection and the life. And you remember what Martha said, you know, about Lazarus raising up. Yeah, I know he's going to raise up the last day. But you remember what Jesus said? He said, Martha, he says, I am the resurrection. And I am the life. And we don't have to wait till the last day. Matter of fact, Jesus went on to raise him from the dead. Jesus is going to appear to the disciples Thomas, at this point in John 20, 27 to 29, he's not, going to be, he's not going to be present, but the ten are. And Jesus reveals himself that he was the one that had died, and now he was the one that had been resurrected. In the book of Acts, it's Acts chapter 2, after the Pentecost, the apostle Peter gets up with the other 11 apostles, and he begins to preach, and he uses Joel in that of his introduction, that this is the fulfillment of the prophet, that of Joel. And one of the main, main, main points of, that of his sermon was the fourth point, but he tells his listeners that Jesus Christ, his death and his resurrection, proves that, he is, that he, is, he is Christ and that he is the Lord. Then later the apostle Peter would go to the house of Cornelius in that of Acts chapter 10 in verses 39 through 40, and he would begin to tell that of Cornelius, a centurion, 
a Gentile, and his family. He would proclaim that of Jesus, that he went around doing that that was good, doing good works, and that he was the Son of God in that debt of his death and resurrection. Did you know this morning that if we're saved, did you know if we experience salvation in our heart and our life, it's, it's based basically on the foundation of the belief in the resurrection. It's Romans 10 and 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shall be saved. I believe in the name this morning of Jesus. I believe that his name is a name that's above every name. I believe in his death. I believe in his resurrection. And then Paul will go on and say, And whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know what, y'all? We're saved this morning because we believe in his name. We believe in his death. We believe in his resurrection. We believe that he's real. We believe that he's alive. And he's alive forevermore. And he's the blessed son of that of God in whom we believe. Sister Betty Jean, Sister Vicky, was, myself were talking about some of the things that we're seeing today that we never thought we would believe to see it. We didn't believe it, Betty Jean, but one thing about it is we do believe in Jesus because he is the living son of that of God. And within this living Savior, just let me just make mention of two or three things. He is the living water. This living son of God, he is the living water and you know what this living water does? It satisfies. It's in John 4 and it's in verse 14 that Jesus has gone and sat down at Jacob's well. And there's a woman that comes there at midday. And she comes to draw water. And this woman's life has been totally messed up. She's been married time and time and time and time again. And seems like she can't be satisfied. But Jesus said to her, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a will springing up into everlasting life. How many of you experience that in your heart, in your life, by believing on the name of that of Jesus Christ, of his death, and that of his resurrection, that you have accepted him? Don't you feel that living water springing up within you? In other words, when you found that of Jesus, you were looking something or someone to bring satisfaction, and when you found him, you found that living water that what? Quenched your spiritual thirst of your heart and that of your soul. You remember what David said about the great shepherd and that great shepherd being Jesus in, in Psalm 23, 1 and 2? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me what? To lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside the still waters. In other words, my shepherd, that great shepherd, satisfies that of my thirst, of my physical, and that of my spiritual thirst. Jesus in John 7, 37 and 38, he's going to make reference to this of the coming of the Holy Ghost, but he stood, stands up the last day of the feast and says, you know what, if any man thirsts, you know what, we've got a lot of people, thirsty people in this world, and they're drinking from a lot of things, but they're not satisfied. But Jesus said, and he stands up, that if any man thirsts, let him come unto me, and out of his innermost being, out of his belly, shall flow rivers of that of living water. Even in Revelation 22, 1 and 17, the last few parts, uh, the last few parts of the, uh, the book of Revelation, those verses, those last one or two chapters, God is going to make all things new. And one of the new things is going to be the new paradise and the river of death of the water of life flowing from that of the throne of God. Why? Because he is the living water. He's the one that's alive. He's the one who satisfies us. So he's the living water. 
You know, I just happened to look, and Deborah's got her bottle of water. We got to have our water. But you know what, y'all? We got to have Christ. But we got to have a little bread to go along with the water. And he's the bread in whom we feed. In John 6 and 57, as the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. You remember what the psalmist said, 34 and 8 of Psalm? Oh, taste! Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusteth in him. In the temptation of that of Jesus in, in Matthew 4, 1 through 4, Satan is putting Christ to the test and trying him. And you remember what he said? Jesus has fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights and he's hungry. He's divine, but yet he's human. And he's hungry. And the devil said, you know what? If you be the son of God, command the stones to be made bread. And Jesus comes back and says, you know what? It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Jesus is the living son of God. He's the living water who satisfies us. He's the son of God in whom we believe. He's the living bread in whom we feed. But he's also this. He's the living stone on whom we build. Peter said this in 1 Peter 2 and 4. To whom coming as into a living or a living stone disallowed indeed of that of man but chosen of that of God and precious. You see, Jesus Christ, the living stone, is kind of different to different people that believe or don't believe. You know what he was to Israel? When he came on the scene, you know what he was? He was a stumbling stone. He was a rock of that of offense. In other words, what he believed and what he taught made the nation, made the Jews to stumble. But you know what he is to the church? He is the foundational stone. In other words, the church has been built upon him. You know, I think about this church here. This church has been here a very long time. I think somewhere around a hundred and 120, well, Renee said 120 years. There about 115, 120 years. And do you know why this church, I really believe with all my heart, has been here as long as it has? Because it is part of the church. This is a church that we got believers that is part of the church. But this church has stood. And I believe it stood because it was built on a good, strong foundation. And not only that of a local, that of a church and a community, but as you as part of the body of Christ and members of the church, you don't have to worry about falling and failing if you're, if you're built upon that of the foundation or stone. And by the way, to the Gentile world system, this same stone, this same rock, where it means different things to different people, is going to one day destroy this Gentile world system. And then Jesus Christ is going to rule, and Jesus Christ is going to reign. Vicki, what time do we have, ma'am? 8.25? That means if we pray for about five good minutes, we'll be ready. I want you to stand, if you would, please. Aren't you glad that Jesus is alive? Amen. I know the tomb is empty. 
And you know how I know the tomb is empty and he's not there? Because he lives and he abides in my heart and my life. And here's another good thing. Because he lives, you and I can pray. And we know, know that God can hear and answer our prayers. Our Heavenly Father, it is good to start out this Easter day. Dear Lord God, a little early. And dear Lord, as we got up today and we listened outside, as Sister Betty Jean saw the sun was rising, we saw the sun rise as well. And dear Lord, not only that, but dear Lord, in our community, dear Lord, it sounded like a jungle of where the birds were tweeting and where they were praising you. And Lord, we're thankful that you're real and we're thankful that you're alive. Dear Lord, that you're touched, dear Lord, by the feelings of our infirmities. And dear Lord, we have given in requests, we have taken requests, and you have heard those requests. And dear Lord, we do pray for Ginger, and we do pray for Bill, and we do pray for Jeff. And we do pray, dear Lord God, for that family that you will bless them. And dear Lord, that vacant spot, dear Lord, that has, dear Lord God, has formed, dear Lord, in their lives because of the missing death of a, of a mother. We pray that you will bless them. And dear Lord, that you will give them strength, and dear Lord, you will fill that gap. And dear Lord, we pray for Sister Jean and Renee, and dear Lord God, for the family, that you will bless them. And dear Lord God, we understand that there are some things we don't understand. And dear Lord, that you will put your arms around them, dear Lord God, and love them, and they will cast their care on the Lord because the Lord cares for them. And dear Lord, these other requests, my brother and dear Lord God, his wife, I pray, dear Lord, that you would touch them and you would minister to them and draw them closer to you. And dear Lord, there's other requests, dear Lord, that's represented in this, this service, dear Lord God, that has been acknowledged and there are more requests than there are people. But dear Lord God, you are a merciful, gracious God that there's nothing too big there's nothing too hard for thee, Lord. I don't care how many prayer requests, dear Lord God, that we have, but you can remember them and you can answer them. And Father, as we make our way, dear Lord God, into the fellowship building, may your spirit and may your presence that we feel that we acknowledge, dear Lord, this day that it's alive. May you go with us, dear Lord, and may you walk in our midst. And may, dear Lord God, we walk in your midst. And dear Lord, may you bless everything that's said, everything that's done. Bless the Lord the food to give us strength to serve you in the hands that prepared it. And I'll say amen. amen. All right, you got you, you got you, you got the word. What to do in here and what to do in yonder. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.